Why should anyone care about Georgia? Well, you could say that it was the prequel to what has become the Ukrainian war. Long before Putin invaded Crimea, Georgians had already been visited by Russian tanks. In fact, even today, Russia still basically controls two regions in this country, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And in the past, long before Zelensky became Putin's number one enemy, it was Mikhail Saakashvili who held this title. And believe me, we're talking about real hatred. Check out what Putin had to say. Vladimir Putin threatened to hang Georgia leader by the balls. If you're a long-time follower of visual politics, you already know who I'm talking about. If you're not, allow me to introduce you to one of the most fascinating characters in international politics. I'd always thought that if he had been an American, he would have four series on Netflix by now. Mikhail Saakashvili was a former president of Georgia. Under his rule, the Georgian economy took off, and this former Soviet republic became closer to the West than ever before. After losing the elections, he renounced his Georgian citizenship and became a Ukrainian citizen. Once in Ukraine, he became governor of Odessa. Zelensky even appointed him director of the National Council of Reforms. But in 2021, he decided to return to his native Georgia. And don't think that he went by a plane like a regular person. He crossed the border, hiding in the trailer of a dairy truck. Why? Because he had a warrant for his arrest in Georgia. That means that, at any border control, he could be arrested. That's right. This guy leaves no one indifferent. Many Georgians still support him. Others hate him. Not least those who currently control the country. I'm imprisoned by a regime that is using my captivity as an act of allegiance to Vladimir Putin, Mikhail Saakashvili. As soon as he arrived, he was arrested and basically sent to prison, both for entering the country illegally and for six other pending offenses. Since then, his health has worsened drastically. Part of this is due to the hunger strikes he has staged. But there are also signs of much more concerning things. Take a look. In new recordings, former Georgian president and Putin foe alleges abuse amid claims he is being poisoned. And keep in mind that we're talking about a very important friend of the United States in the region. Region. But the most important thing about this story is that it is symptomatic of something much bigger. Georgia is building bridges with the Kremlin. And the question is why? Think about it this way. We're talking about a country that de facto has territories invaded by Russia. A country that has received thousands of Russians fleeing Putin's regime. How is it possible that they have such good relations with Moscow? Are the connections between Moscow and the ruling Georgian Dream Party clear? What implications could the Ukrainian war have on all of this? Today we're going to answer these questions, but first, are you doing anything to prevent your personal information? from being sold on the internet without your knowledge. In case you didn't know, this is widespread and growing. According to the Identity Theft Resource Center's annual report on data breaches, there were 68% more breaches in 2021 than the previous year. The good news is that you have the right to protect your privacy by asking data brokers to remove the information they have about you. But the bad news is that it would take you years to do it manually. Luckily, Incogni, our sponsor today, will help you solve this problem in three easy steps. First, create an account and enter your details. Second, grant them the right to go to work for you. They will contact the data brokers on your behalf to request the removal of your personal data. And Third, relax and watch them work. They'll handle any objections from the data brokers and keep you informed of their progress every step of the way. And the best of all, the first 100 of you who use the code POLITICEN via the link below will get 20% off at Incogni. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. The Georgian Odyssey. Many of you surely know that Georgia was once part of the Soviet Union. But what I'm not so sure many of you know is that one of the most important Soviet leaders of all history was born and lived in this place. Do you have any idea who we're talking about? Yes, none other than Joseph Stalin. But let's not get ahead of ourselves because before Georgia was part of the USSR, it was part of other empires. From ancient Greece and the Roman Empire to the Persians and the Ottomans, the territory of Georgia was almost always under the control of some foreign power. These lands were unified and relatively prosperous between the 10th and 12th centuries. But from then on, and practically until the 19th century, it was all invasions and plundering. In fact, the situation was so bad that the principalities into which today's Georgia was divided even asked to join Russia in order to get protection. And of course, they got it. But at what price? Well, at quite a high one, because the Russification campaign started almost immediately. This fueled local nationalism, which led, along with the Bolshevik coup d'etat in Russia in 1917, the declaration of Georgian independence in 19. Of course, this did not last long. Just four years later, in 1921, the Soviet Union annexed this territory once again. 
Following that, the new Soviet Georgia began to experience a certain process of industrialization and urbanization, but it also suffered harshly under the typical repression of the Soviet state and the campaigns of cultural and ethnic homogenization, a process that lasted until 1991, when the collapse of the USSR gave way to Georgian independence once more. However, another odyssey was about to begin. As soon as independence was achieved, all kinds of problems began to arise. A civil war, ethnic conflicts in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, a very tough economic crisis, etc, etc, etc. Given such a situation, the Soviet oligarch Edward Shivard Nadza, the last foreign minister of the Soviet Union itself, was put in charge of the country by the military after a coup d'etat in 1992. At the beginning, its data were not bad. It managed to end the civil war in 1995, and the economy began to improve slightly after GDP had fallen 78% between 1991 and 1995. However, problems were accumulating. 50% of the population could not make ends meet, corruption was still rampant in every corner, and authoritarianism had become the fundamental characteristic of the government. Finally, after the threatening and coercing of the Rustavi 2 television channel and accusations of the rigging of the elections, came the events that would transform Georgia, the Rose Revolution. And who was leading this revolution? Exactly, our friend Saakashvili. <laughs> A lawyer by profession and former justice minister under Shevard Nadzer himself rebelled against his former political godfather and ended up demanding his resignation in his own office. In the end, amid pressure from his own circles and street protests, Shevard Nadzer was forced to throw in the towel and leave power. In 2004, Saakashvili won the presidential elections by an overwhelming majority. And from there, well, let's just say the country did a 180 degree turnaround. Anti-corruption measures saw Georgia advance in a few years from 133rd to 51st in the 2012 Transparency Report, while reforms spurred the economy. In a way, the country set itself a very clear goal, to become a kind of liberal Eden in economic matters. For this, the Saakashvili government did everything you would expect and even more. It introduced flexible labor regulations, low tariffs, low taxes. It reduced bureaucracy and opened up to the outside world particularly to the West. However, visual politic viewers, all that glitters is not gold. Saakashvili's governments had another face. Soon there were allegations of attacks on press freedom, repression of opposition parties, and new cases of corruption. All this led Saakashvili to resign in 2007, only to win the elections again just a year later in 2008. However, during his second term, while economic reforms continued, the accusations were repeated. Worse still, in 2008, he was subjected to Russia's military attack. In 2008, following a series of clashes between South Ossetian pro-independence forces and peasants identifying themselves as Georgians, in a perhaps incomprehensible decision, Saakashvili mobilized the army to put an end, once and for all, to the violence of the Russian-backed separatists. And what a mess it was. The Kremlin saw an opportunity. It accused the Georgian government of wanting to carry out ethnic cleansing, which supposedly justified its intervention. You know, it's something that we talked about before on this channel, the Karaganov Doctrine, which is basically Basically that Russia has to be the protector of ethnic Russians living all countries in its orbit. This is, without digging too deep, the excuse Russia has used to invade Ukraine twice, first in 2014 when it annexed Crimea and then again in 2022. And of course it is also the excuse it used to attack and invade Georgia. In 2008, Russian troops arrived on Georgian territory and advanced to within 40 kilometers of its capital, Tbilisi, while the Air Force damaged strategic targets. Finally, they reached a ceasefire just a couple of weeks after the beginning of the conflict, and then Russia officially recognized the independence of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And so, Saakashvili failed in his promise to restore Georgia's territorial integrity. And to top it all off, his measures were not urgently solving another of the country's major problems, low wages and low pensions. So, in the 2013 presidential elections, Saakashvili decided to run and his party received a harsh punishment. A new political player took all the limelight. We're talking, of course, about the Georgian dream. Listen up. The Lucid Dream of the Soviet Billionaire 
Beginning in 2012, the Georgian Dream Party has dominated Georgian politics since then until today. With a position more slanted to the centre-left, it has been repeatedly accused of whitewashing Putin's Russia within the country. This party could not have gotten to where it is without the drive of its founder, billionaire Bidzina Ivanish Vili. So, if we want to take a look at the accusations against him about his ties with Russia, the first thing that we have to do is get to know Ivanish Vili better. We're talking about the richest man in Georgia, a guy who made his fortune in Russia with multiple more than questionable businesses, and who returned to his native country after the success of the Rose Revolution. He even supported Sakash Vili himself back in the day, a support that lasted until 2011 when he began to launch his own political project. We're talking of course about the Georgian Dream, the party that won by a majority in the parliamentary elections of 2012, which enabled him to become the Prime Minister. And although suddenly, barely a year later, he decided to leave office. The truth is that he remained President, Lord, and Master of his party. Few in Georgia doubt that Ivanish Vili is pulling all of the strings. Be that as it may, the point is that the Georgian dream has gained special importance in recent times. And why is that? Well, because its position as regards Russia is totally different from the one good old Saakashvili would have had. The Georgian Billionaires Party has adopted a much less aggressive discourse with Russia after its criminal invasion of Ukraine. Why? Well, perhaps because of the fear that the country's economy will stagnate even more if it confronts Russia. Because visual politics viewers, if we're talking about the economy, the last few years have not been particularly good. And in the end, Russia, well, what can I say? It's an important trading partner for Georgia. Just take a look. As you can see, Russia is the second largest market for Georgia's exports and is also its second largest supplier. Perhaps that explains why this government has received so many accusations of whitewashing Russia's actions and belittling its own relations with the European Union. And not surprisingly, news like this doesn't exactly help its image. Georgian Dream annuls EU Council April 19th agreement. Of course, we're not strictly talking about new accusations. In 2019, there was already a big stir when Georgian Dream invited a Russian communist MP, Sergei Gavrilov, to join the parliament. And if this already raised suspicions, when Gavrilov sat in the chair of the Speaker of the Parliament and began to give a speech in Russian about the union of Russia and Georgia, that was when the Georgians exploded. Protests demanding resignations erupted in the streets. And while they were at it, the opposition began to call for electoral reforms to make the election results fully proportional. And what do you think happened? Well, against all odds, they managed to get the resignation of the President of the Parliament and also the electoral reform. Most surprising of all, despite all the demonstrations and scandals, the party continues to win elections. And to top it all off, just when its image was at its worst, the pandemic broke out. And here it must be said that a large majority of the population considers that the management of the pandemic was good, or very good. Unbelievable, but true. Georgia is one of those countries where COVID-19, far from punishing the government, gave it a boost in popularity. And so, in 2021, they won the local elections again. Yes, there were still many accusations of fraud and intimidation at the polling stations. Whatever the case, the war in Ukraine has changed everything. How the Georgian dream will face this new challenge? That is something that may be decisive for its survival and also crucial for the future of the country. Listen up. Georgian Nightmare or Russian Miracle? It's no surprise that the conflict between Russia and Ukraine has spilled over into Georgia, and not precisely because they have been involved in it, but because this country has received hundreds of thousands of exiles, fleeing the consequences of the war. But pay attention, because we are not talking about Ukrainian exiles. Look at this. Russians fleeing Putin's war add new strain to old tensions in nearby Georgia. Russians fleeing conscription for the war in Ukraine to Georgia are furthering tensions between two countries that have existed for generations. Exactly. We're talking about Russian exiles who left because they either opposed the war or did not want to run the risk of being drafted to fight on the front. And yes, it is mostly those people who are arriving in Georgia. In fact, from the beginning of the war until Putin's mass conscription announcement in September, about 40,000 Russians moved to Georgia. But guess what? Right after the partial mobilization was announced, hundreds of thousands of Russians suddenly arrived in this small country. All of them. It is estimated that about 100,000 have remained to reside in Georgia. That is almost 3% of the entire Georgian population in just a few weeks. Georgia still does not reach the levels of countries like Estonia, where Ukrainian refugees already account for about 5% of the pre-war population. But still, we're talking about a very significant figure. Now the point is that this massive influx of Russian population is having both a positive and a negative effect on Georgia. Look at this table. 
A good proportion of all of the professionals who have fled Russia have highly qualified profiles, especially when it comes to the technology sector. And now Georgia is benefiting from this. In fact, even the poorest and most remote small villages in Georgia have experienced a certain economic boom, if only because they sell the Russians postal addresses so that they can set up their businesses there. In all, it is estimated that Russians who have arrived in Georgia have already started some 10,000 businesses in the country. Indeed, throughout 2022, the inflow of capital to Georgia had significant effects. For example, the country's international currency reserves increased by 12.2% to $4.9 billion, and the Lari, the local currency, appreciated by 13%. Of course, it's not all good news. Georgians have not yet forgotten what Russia did to them in 2008, and the fact that 20% of the national territory is still under Russian rule certainly does not help. So many of the Russians who have arrived now suffer numerous cases of discrimination. And of course, the righteous end up paying for the sinners. Even Russians who don't support Putin are suffering from a situation that threatens social peace. Obviously, that is not the only problem. The influx of Russians is also fueling a huge housing shortage. Russians need to find a place to live, which is fanning the flames for real estate demand. But that's not all. As in many cases, we're talking about professionals with relatively high incomes. Well, logically, they are willing to pay much more for those houses, which compounds the problem. To give you an idea, since the beginning of the Ukrainian war, rental prices in Tbilisi have skyrocketed. Some estimates speak of rental price increases of up to 210%. For its part, the price of owned housing increased by 28% compared to 2021. In any case, despite the pressure on its real estate market, in general terms, I think we could say that Georgia is benefiting from the arrival of Russian exiles. And guess what? This brings us directly to a key question. Now that Russia is suffering huge military losses in Ukraine and its strength is weakened, while Georgia is apparently getting stronger, will Tbilisi dare to reclaim the territories invaded in 2008? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but most likely no. Why do I say this? Well, among other things, because when Russia invaded Ukraine in early 2022, the Georgian Dream government condemned the act, but did not join the international sanctions against Putin's regime. And of course, we must not forget the size of the Russian army. Of course, many of you will be saying that it's no big deal either. Look how the Ukrainians are doing. But visual politic viewers, do not confuse the size of the Ukrainian army, which is one of the 15 largest in the world, with the Georgian army, which is rather modest. Among other reasons, due to the fact that this country has only 3.7 million inhabitants. And let's not forget that Georgia borders Kadriov's Chechnya and is not protected by NATO. In other words, Georgia's starting point is much worse than that of other small ex-Soviet republics, such as Estonia. Estonia, Latvia, or Lithuania, which can act with much more freedom and independence. Therefore, it is most likely that the Georgian dream does not want to complicate life too much after the pandemic and seeks to reap the fruits of Russian exile and eventually, who knows, maybe even benefit from becoming a kind of bridge for Russia to bypass some of the Western sanctions, which naturally would put a definitive end to the old Georgian dream of integrating into the West. But at this point, the questions are all for you. Do you think Georgia should align itself with the United States and the European European Union and go along with the sanctions against Russia? Will it manage to make an economic profit from the war? Will the Georgians continue to overlook Saakashvili's delicate situation? You can leave your thoughts below in the comments. And as always, don't forget that here on Visual Politic, we release new videos every week. So subscribe for this channel, hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like the video, go ahead and like it, and I'll see you in the next one. All the best. See you soon.